Good evening, YouTube friends and family. Matthew 419. No bucko tonight. It is late, so he's in bed. Um, I wanted to give you part three of my campus preaching series. And um, this this young man I'm talking to is named Tucker. He's a naturalist. And one thing you'll notice in the video is that it's going to seem like I'm talking like a million miles an hour, talking really fast. The reason is because it was late afternoon, and in northern Wisconsin, it's getting cold, and this kid was underdressed. So he was kind of standing hunched up, blowing on his hands and everything. So I'm trying to give him as much information as possible, um, respecting the fact that he's probably not going to want to stand there very long. However, he stood there with me almost 40 minutes. So, um, so he got a lot of information, asked a lot of great questions. So here's Tucker, the naturalist. You got a question? You're just hanging and listening? Yeah, hey, man. Connor, I'm Len. Nice to meet you, Len. You an atheist? I'm a naturalist. Okay, tell me what that means. So it's belief in the natural world and not the supernatural world, more or less. So you believe that truth is revealed through the five senses? Something similar to that, yes. If you look at it, um, anything that influences atoms, for instance, like, I can touch that tree over there, or I can more or less smell, I can see it, yes. But then when it comes into the supernatural world, there's a definition of things that you cannot see, hear, or smell. And okay. by definition, God can't be seen, heard, smell. He okay. is unknowable, but all-encompassing. So it's very, it's okay. more or less based on the evidence of yes, the five Right. Seconds. So what, what about metaphysical? You have the physical, the supernatural. The supernatural. Yeah, so supernatural. logic is supernatural? Logic supernatural. No, logic is more or less breaking down through the evidence of the five senses, like you're saying. Right, but it's metaphysical in the, that I can't go to the cupboard and get two pounds of logic and give it to you. No, right? no, no. That is ideas, yeah. That's right. more or less. So you're saying it's more of um, ideas is metaphysical. Right. Okay, that's it. Things like logic, morality, um, things, things of that nature. Those things are neither physical nor supernatural. They're metaphysical. Okay. I They're see. outside of the physical world. I was confusing supernatural and metaphysical. Mm -hmm. so, so how do you classify yourself? You're a naturalist. Does that mean that you are agnostic? That you're... Well, I mean, to be honest... Like, where did, where did all the stuff come from? Where did all this stuff come from? Yeah, everything. Where did, where did matter come from? Matter? Well, to be honest... Creation of the universe is kind of what was the God particles that we got into? The Higgs boson. Yeah. Did you get it? Yeah. Well, theory is that we all started in like a little bit of matter and exploded out into what we have now, and that's more or less. So matter is eternal. Well, matter is well, like it says, you can't destroy it, you can't create it, but it's always. Well, that's there. energy. Yeah, that's energy and matter. So, no, just energy. It's second law of thermodynamics: that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Right. So that explains energy. Although I, I would say that that energy was created by God. In the beginning, God created, there's the energy, his creative power, the heavens and the earth. And there's your matter. So would you have that as the Big Bang or the God particle, or would you have that? No, I, well, you know, how it happened, if it started at a single point and expanded, that's entirely possible. The Bible doesn't really say, but the Bible is very clear that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He did it in six literal days. Because um, we know this because of the way that the sentence structure is laid out. A lot of people look at Genesis 1 and they think that's poetic language. And it's not. Because there is a style in the Hebrew writing called Vav Consecutives. It would be like saying, and then. And then God did this. And then God did that. And then. So Genesis 1 has give or take 50, excuse me, Vav Consecutives. We have a poetic account of creation in Psalm 104. There's only three Vav consecutives. So we know it's not a poetic style. The other thing that we know is that the Hebrew word for day is Yom. Like you've heard of Yom Kippur, the Jewish yeah. Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement. A lot of people say, well, those days could have been a period of time. But the word Yom is used in the Hebrew 1,246 times in the Old Testament. And it never means anything more than a short period of time. It would be like my grandpa saying, well, in my day, bread cost five cents a, a loaf. You know, back in his, when, in his youth, 
but it never ever means millions of years. And an immutable law of Hebrew writing is that whenever there is an adjective before the word yom, then it always means a singular day. On the first day, on the second day, on the third day. You know, so we know because of the style of Hebrew writing in Genesis 1 that God created it and he did it in literal days. Now, some people try to get all, like, put a date on it. Like, it happened 6,500 years ago. It happened, whatever. You know, I think, I believe in a young earth. I don't know how young. I know it's not 14 billion. That's just, that just doesn't logically follow for me. Because we do have genealogies that point to the fact that we are, we are less than 20,000 years from the flood of Noah in Genesis 6. So let me ask you something. You have like a correspondence theory of truth. So you're saying uh, the way I disseminate truth is that right. Like truth yeah. comes through your five senses, your memory, your or reason. More or less the analyzing of certain things, like I said with the tree. Okay. Yeah, basically. Okay. So now you would agree, because my 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 what I'm putting forth today is that without God, you can't know anything. God is a necessary precondition for knowledge for truth, logic, morality, and the uniformity of nature, okay? So that's what I'm putting forth. And you're saying that truth, and also truth is that which corresponds to the mind of God. What you are saying is that truth is what you can see, sense, and observe. Perception. Right, perception. So um, you would agree that there are people in this world who do not have valid reasoning, right? There's people who live in plastic, rubber, right, okay? How do you know you're not one of those people? Well, how do you know, I know you're that, not like the delusion of a madman in a well, delusion of a madman? To be honest, I can know that I exist personally because I can think and I have a conscious and I can disseminate things in my mind. Okay. But I don't know if you exist and I don't know if all this exists exactly. That can be totally up in the air. I can't prove either way. Okay. So could you be wrong? What was your name again? I was Connor. So. Connor. Okay. Connor, could you be wrong about everything you claim to know? Depends on what exactly you're talking about. Everything you mean, like everything I perceive in the universe, or do you mean right. like knowledge that I've disseminated? Everything. Everything that you claim to know, could you be wrong about it? That if we have a sky and that we have clouds. Yeah. Yep. I mean, if we're going to go in depth about it, my mind could be making this entirely up. I don't know. Right. Right. See, and that's what this is what scripture says, Connor, is that when you reject the God of scripture, that you will embrace absurdity. Okay? And I'm not trying to be insulting to you or anything, but how much, let me ask you this. What percentage of all the known knowledge in the universe do you think you have? Me personally? Yeah. I wouldn't even call it a fraction of a fraction of a fraction. Right. Infinitesimal, right? Yeah. Here's my thing. If you don't know everything, it's impossible to know anything. Because let's say you, let's say you have 1% of all the knowledge in the universe, right? then the 99% of the knowledge that you don't have could contradict the knowledge that you do have. That makes sense? All the knowledge you have, that 1% could be contradicted by the 99. So you either have to have all knowledge to know anything, or you have to have revelation from someone who does. Wow. And that is the proof that God exists. The fact that you know things, the fact that you can observe things and know them as truth, that's how you know that God exists, because he reveals himself to all of us so that we can know him for certain. God condemns people to hell because they know he exists, and they suppress that truth in their unrighteousness. And they give glory to other things created other than God. That's what Romans chapter 1 says, that people worship will worship the creation rather than the creator. Idolization. Right. Well, and that's basically what naturalism is. You put all of your faith in like, wow, look, and you trace it back to this big bang, and you're, you stand in awe of that, and you give glory to that. That's what idolatry is. When God says, cast all your idols aside, he, when he said, I will have, you will have no other gods before me, he's not saying he wants rank. Like, okay, God is first, and then the big bang, and da-da-da-da-da. No, God wants primacy over everything. When he says you'll have no other gods before me, he says you'll have no other gods, period. And that is the primary sin that man has committed, is creating idols in their heart. 
That's what the book of Ezekiel says. Most people think idolatry is like carving a statue out of wood or stone or forging one out of metal in the fire or something like that, putting it on the mantle and worshiping that. But the Bible says that we have, we're uh, idolaters of our heart. We set up in our mind and our hearts idols that we worship above God. And typically, for us Americans, it's our mirror. <laughs> we worship ourselves and we worship... Celebrities outside. Right. And that's why we're here to let you know that you need to repent for this. You need to turn to Christ because the Bible says this. The Bible says that in Christ lie all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge lie in Christ. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus himself claimed to be truth. That's why I say truth is that which corresponds with the mind of God. And the fact that you know things exposes that truth to you. And that's why you need to repent to turn from your sin and turn to Jesus Christ. Do you know the, do you know the gospel? Do you, have you ever heard like the, the whole the Christmas story? Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, right? You see the nativity, he's in the manger. The importance of that virgin birth is that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. Born without sin. Born without sin. The Bible says you and I are born dead in our sin. We are still born. Uh, Psalm 51.5 says that in sin you were conceived and brought forth in iniquity. All right? And we've never done anything but sin our entire life because... Jesus said in John 8, 32, that he who sins is a slave to sin. We are fully enslaved to sin because it's our nature. We don't, we don't, we're not sinners because we sin every once in a while. We sin because we're sinners by our nature, by birth, at our core. And that's why Jesus had to come to die so that his perfect life could be credited to you, Connor, if you would repent of your sin and put your faith in him. And then your sin will be credited to him. It's called the doctrine of imputation, that he who knew no sin became sin for us, so that in him, in Christ, we can have the righteousness of God. So J Jesus' perfection is given to us. And then our sin was put on him. So when we stand before God, and 165,000 people die every day, all right? The Bible says it's appointed unto man to die once, and after that it's judgment. So when you die, it's over. All the chances are gone. If you die in your sin, you have to pay for your sin yourself with an eternity in hell. Because all sin is primarily against God. And all sin is highly offensive to him. Who's, it says the foundation of his throne is righteousness and justice. Because God is just, he's a just judge, he must carry out justice. Okay, he has to uphold the law just like any good judge, right? All right. But the justice was laid on Christ on the cross. If you would repent of your sin, that turn from it. A lot of people ask, well, is repentance something I do, something I say, or something I think? Right? You ever heard the word repentance? Something repent? Yeah. In the Greek, is metanoia means a change of mind. It means you change your mind about who God is, about who you are. See, a lot of us think we're good. We're taking a chance that, well, even if God does exist, I've been a pretty good person. God would never send me to hell because I've been pretty good, right? We're, take, we're gambling on that. But the Bible says something very clearly that there is nothing you can do to please a holy, perfect God. That all of our righteousness is like a filthy menstrual cloth before God. That's what Isaiah 64, 6 literally says. That all your righteousness is a filthy rag, okay? So you need the righteousness of Christ given to you. Well, how would that be provided to you, though? That's the thing. That's the, one of the big things many ask is, okay, if I wanted to repent, would that be just a belief in God, or would that be an understanding or in following rules? Or, well, well, it's like the Jewish community has Jewish rules. Right, you follow right. follow this, and that's yeah. good in the eyes of God. But Christianity doesn't really establish that very often. Right. So it's more <clears throat> interpreting the Bible uh, with theologians for hundreds of right. years have been debating over and over right. what the Bible right. means. So right. it's very difficult for the layman yeah. to understand. Yeah, exactly. And here's the thing. That's a, that's a great question. Christianity isn't about rules. It isn't about doing. Okay? Um, it's not about obedience and following a set of rules. That's what religion says. Religion says, follow all these rules 
and you'll merit salvation for yourself. That's what Islam says when it says doing the five pillars, doing the Hajj and the almsgiving. You know, there's the, the Catholics, they have their sacraments that they have to do to earn salvation. The Bible, Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, paid in full. You are saved by grace through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So it is faith. It is a faith that leads you to repentance. And not a repentance that's like a kid with his hand caught in a cookie jar. He gets a spanking and he's sorry he got caught. It's your recognition that your sin is so offensive to a holy God who sent his son on the cross to die. And you recognize your own sinfulness, you recognize the goodness of God, and you say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And you have God's promise that when that happens, he will remove your sins from you as far as the east is from the west. Past, present, future, all sins forgiven. However, that is not a pass to go continue living in sin. Okay? The Christian will stumble into sin, the person who's not a Christian dives headfirst into it. Doesn't care. Sex with that girl? Yeah, I don't care. I'm going to do it because I'm a man. And that's what men do. Quite you know? Yeah, right. The Christian says, I'm walking in holiness. I live for Christ and I'm following him. That's what it's about, dude. That's what it's about is, you know, 1 Corinthians 5 5, or I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 5 5 says, The love of Christ compels us to live for him who died for us. Be like, you know, if you're drowning and I pull you out of the water and you're blue, man, there is nothing you can do. I mean, you're, you're a dead sack, you're blue, and I'm giving you chest compressions, mouth to mouth, chest compressions, mouth to mouth, and you spit out the water and your heart starts pumping again and you come back to life. You think I'm gonna stand over you and say, okay, now, come on you're going to come and paint my shed for me. No, but you're going to look at me and say, if it wasn't for you, I would be in a frigging grave six feet under right now. And I'm so grateful to you. Look, what can I, can, let me buy you lunch. Let me do something. And I'm like, no, dude, no, no. You know, it's faith. It's faith. It's not about following a set of rules. That's legalism. And the Bible condemns legalism. The Bible condemns those who would, um, you know, uh, Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. All Jesus asks is that you turn from your sin, rec that, again, changing your mind, changing your mind about your sin, who you are, who God is, the value of Christ. Most people tread, them, tread on, you know, tread the, the blood of Christ underfoot like it's nothing. But what you have to recognize is that the Bible says it pleased God to crush his only son, who he loved. If he would do that to his son on the cross, who he loved, what would he have waiting for you, who the Bible says you stand as his enemy? I mean, it's a fearful thing. And that's why we're here telling you, like, this, is, this has eternal consequences. You know what I'm saying? Well, I guess I have two questions. Please. Okay. So, first off, what would be the definition of sin? And then second off, what if I knew that I had sinned but uh -huh. didn't believe in God? Okay. So it's more Well, um, the definition of sin, there's a couple. The Bible says the tr definition of sin is a transgression of God's law, breaking God's law, the so Ten Commandments. The commandments yeah. Right. So, Ninth Commandment, have you ever told a lie? Yes. What do you call someone who tells lies? A liar. Have you ever stolen anything regardless of value? Okay, that's the Eighth Commandment. What do you call someone who steals things? A thief. Okay. Have you ever taken God's name in vain before? Yes, I have. Okay, that's the Third Commandment. And Jesus said, or uh, the Bible says, rather, that um, uh, it is the enemies of God who take his name in vain. That's why I say you're an enemy of God when you stand before him unrepentant, okay? Um, have you ever committed adultery before? Yes. Okay. Jesus said this. He said, you've heard it said by them of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you look upon a woman to lust for her, you commit adultery with her already in your heart. See, just like our heart is an idol factory, God is discerning the very thoughts of our mind, the intentions of our hearts. So it's not just the things we do that sin, it's the things that we think. 
that sin also. Now here's another thing that the other definition of sin is violating your conscience. When you know it's right and you do the wrong anyway. It's just like you said, you know, you know you, you know that it's sin, but I don't believe in God. Well that's two sins. You've sinned against God and you deny that God exists. That's the greatest sin there is. That's why the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Even when you say there is no God, what have you made God? Yourself. You've made yourself as your you've made your own God and it's you, like I say, the mirror, right? So that's why I'm saying that it's because of the sin that you've committed a God, against God that warrants hell for you, but God demonstrates his love to us in this, that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. And your response to this is to repent and believe. And that repentance and that belief should lead you to a changed life. Okay, the Bible says if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. That's why, you know, you hear the term born again Christian. You're literally, that's what the other side of that sign says. You have to be born again. That if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And it's not something you do. It's not like this willful change of behavior. It's because God changes you. When you do that, God gives you the Holy Spirit that dwells within you. And it inclines, he inclines your heart toward himself. Make sense? Probably not a whole lot. Well, I mean, I guess myself and many are put off by the sin and repentance because it's so much black and white in the sense of yeah. gray area. And we live in a gray world. But, yeah. I mean, I should say we live in a black and white world, but we create these gray zones for ourselves because we love our sin. Okay, well, I you mean, know? Yeah. I, look at the Ten Commandments, for instance. Uh -huh. um, Theft is obviously bad by society right. and by religion, most religions, all religions, basically. Right. Mm -hmm. But then if you look in the gray area, the man steals the bread to feed his family, and yes, it may have done a wrong thing, but in his mind, he had to feed his family. Right. And then there is adultery and lust. I mean, biologically, we're programmed to reproduce and make more children, obviously. Right. And then there is those who obviously do this too much, and right. then that kind of is it. And here's, here's the thing. Here's why when Jesus said... You know, when you look with lust, you commit adultery. What Jesus was doing is he was magnifying the law. He was making the law unattainable because the Jews at that time thought that if they, they could just earn heaven by their obedience. They didn't the need law. faith. They could just follow the law. The Bible says this, that the law is a tutor to lead us unto Christ. That we should look at the law and say, there, I can't do that. I can't do it. We should be crushed under the weight of it. And it should cause us to look to the cross of Christ and see the one who did do it. That's the whole point. Christ living perfect, he obeyed all of God's laws. He never violated his conscience. And when he hung on the cross, he hung perfect. So he was taking on our sin. And by our faith in him, his perfection is imputed to us. Okay, well, I mean, if we look at the definition of sin by going against conscience, again, it right. goes back... It looks like a murder. That's a that's a sin. Yeah. Right. So, but there are people who kill every day for right. country, for yep. people to yep. protect others, and again, that kind of goes in the gray area. And I know it's absolutes a lot of the time, but yeah. there is, I guess, like I said before, people get put off because of the harsh penalties of those who are trying to do their best in a hard Right. Well, you can try to do your best. And I encourage you to do your best, but your best isn't good enough to merit salvation. So just starting with the, that you're not, you're in sin and you can't really get out. Right. Of it. You, you, right. You're circling the drain. 165,000 people die every day. You don't know when your last day is going to be. But when you die, you will stand before God and give an account. Hebrews 9.27 says it's appointed unto man to die once, and after this comes judgment. And this is the judgment, you know, that God is going to judge us not about, you know, it's not, again, he's not, he, it's not like he's got like, a, okay. Uh, not like he, Santa where he's got a list. Exactly, exactly. It's not like that. He's just going to look at you and see you. And we're all born dead in our sin. He knows that she's going to cast you into hell. If you stand before him in Christ, the Bible says that you are literally clothed in Christ. You are clothed in him, clothed in his righteousness. So when God looks at you, he doesn't see you. He sees his perfect son, Jesus Christ. And uh, Paul said this, Romans 13, 14 says, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ 
and make no provision for the flesh or the lust thereof. So that's what the Christian life is. It's walking in holiness, not to be perfect, but make no provision for the flesh means, hey, dude, don't go to a strip club if you're a Christian. Don't put yourself in a position where you're going to commit lust. Although if you go to the beach and you see women, you can't help it, but you don't like it. You know what I mean? Like we have these natural sinful inclinations and when we get saved, those don't just get ripped away from us. There's a process called sanctification where we grow in holiness. So you become a Christian, five years later, you should be able to look back and say, boy, I've come a long way, baby. But not you, Christ in you. You know? That's the whole point. It's not about, okay, now go and make no idols, go and stop stealing, go and, I mean, you should do those or things. Try your best Right. You should do those things, but not to earn heaven for yourself, but because you love Christ, you know what a, an, a, an offense that sin is to God, and you don't want to offend him, and it should compel you to lead a different kind of life. That's, the, that's what it's about. Dude. Okay, so we already yeah. established that sin, you're born with it, you do it all the time, yep. and you grow in holiness and so on, but you're always right. sinning. Right. So the main point you're trying to make is that you need to believe in God and understand that you've accepted sin. Is that what you're saying? Right. So, okay. So that's the important thing. You can accept sin, but if you don't believe in God, that's kind of bad. But if you believe in God and accept sin, that's better. Well, so. here's the thing. <clears throat> Paul wrote this in Hebrews 6, 1. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound all the more? God forbid it. So, again, being a Christian isn't license to sin. And in fact, Galatians 5 says that don't let your liberty, because we do have liberty as Christians. So we, he's given us liberty, but he said, don't let your liberty lead you to licentiousness. Again, don't go home and look at porn on the internet because oh, I have Christian liberty. No, if you do those things, if you, are, if you are deliberately pursuing sin, it is evidence that Christ has not changed your heart. But if you sin and you are pursuing Christ and you, the Bible says, that there's like a war. There's a war between the new Holy Spirit that lives within you and your sin. All right? And they're like doing battle. And this battle goes on the rest of your life. That you're always going to be tempted. But, you know, the Bible says that Jesus te was tempted every way as man was, except without sin. And that when you are tempted, when you become tempted, that God will always give you the means out. So, are you going to look for that means? Or are you just going to be like, well... Oh, can't help it, got to look at porn today. You know, I can't help it, I got to have sex with my girlfriend today because I have these urges and I got to fulfill them. No, God promises you he'll give you a way out. So you should be seeking those. But when you do sin, it should be this attitude of, ah, how could I do this to the God I adore? Lord, forgive me, you know. And humility, you know, that's what, being humble about it, you know. That's what it's about. And it's not about keeping a list of rules forever and ever but again the love of Christ should compel you to live for him who died for you if you truly truly believe in him okay well Kay? let's look at this then Kay? so there's multitudes of different churches in the Protestant yep. section of Christianity there is the one church Catholic you have the Eastern Orthodox right. you have right. Islam and their different sects you have Judaism yep. and different sects you have Hinduism yep. You have the different sects in Asia with the belief structures as well. Yep. And I'm not going to go, you've already heard this question so many times of like, which is right, but right, it's right, more, yeah. I guess, let's look at uh, the Abrahamic religions. They mm -hmm. all came from Abraham and they're all belief in the one God, but it's the different messengers, you know what I mean? Yep. Like with Islam, it's Muhammad, and the Jewish people, it was originally more of Abraham or his descendants, and then their prophets and the yep. Christianity, they see... Jesus Christ as that was does your church see it as all prophets are at least in the belief of God even the different sections or is it more just uh, Jesus Christ is the one prophet more or less um, well Jesus Christ the Bible describes Christ as prophet priest and king okay, okay. so he's all I'm of sorry, those he's God he was God in the flesh and he demonstrated that by ri raising from the dead the resurrection demonstrates his deity um so all the prophets of the Old Testament are valid. All of the Old Testament prophets point to Christ. All of the Old Testament... Well, they point to Messiah. That's the big difference here, yeah. Well, um, yes, they point to Messiah. 
and Jesus said, I am Messiah. In Luke chapter 4, he read the scroll of Isaiah, and he said, you know, that uh, I can't remember what chapter of Isaiah he was reading, but he read it, and he said, today this prophecy has been fulfilled in your hearing. He was saying, hey, here I am. I'm the Messiah. You know, he can't get really more clear than that. And they sought to kill him. They sought to stone him because they knew their Messiah would be God. He was claiming to be the, the son of God, which the Hebrews would have seen. If, you, that if I say that I'm my father's son, that means I have the same authority as my father. Okay? So when Jesus said, I, you know, I'm the son of God, he was claiming to be God. And they sought to stone him for that. Well, there was many who claiming that they were the Messiah. That right. Came, yeah. But all... 425 Old Testament prophecies all fulfilled in Christ perfectly. Every single one of them. Now, here's the thing. <clears throat> if we were to t build a two-foot gate around the state of Texas, fill it with quarters, paint one of those quarters red, throw it out in the middle somewhere where it could be buried or on top or whatever, then I blindfold you, spin you around ten times, get you dizzy, and say you get one blindfold reach to grab down and grab that red coin. The odds of you doing that are the same odds of one man fulfilling 425 prophecies written, most of them, 700 years or more before his life, before he was even born. The, the cru crucifixion, for example, the crucifixion in um, Psalm 22 was prophesied it was prophesied um, a thousand years before crucifixion was invented as a means of execution by the Persian Empire. That's how specific scripture is. All right, the Persians invented it, and it blew up in the pagan world as a means of execution because it was so. It was seen as such a means of. Uh, they did it publicly, right? And it, it, it's intimidation. You come in here, you mess up. This is what's happening to you. You know, so. Well, I mean, there are some who believe he's the Messiah. And then oh, yeah, yeah, there's, them, right, Messianic Jews. I guess yeah. it's, well, I mean, Orthodox, pure Orthodox Jews believe that when the Messiah comes, he will recreate Israel and Jerusalem. Right. And then they didn't see that happen, and so they can't really right. believe that. And then most of the denominations follow in that footstep. I guess it's not really a dislike. It's more of it's not fulfilling their opinion of what it should be. Right, and the thing is, it's like, have you ever been to the mountains before? Um, Rockies. Okay. Been to the Rockies, you skier? Skier? Oh, I'm uh, terrible at skiing. Snowboarder? No? Nope. Okay. Nah. All right, I'm a big skier. I've been out to the Rockies a nice. lot. So, you, you know, if you've driven through the mountains, it's like, you know, if you're driving at Denver and hitting I-70 West, and it's like, you see these mountains in the foreground, they're like, oh, wow, that's amazing, man. That's beautiful. Then you go over the pass, and the rest of the mountains are exposed. The grander, the greater mountains are exposed. You're like, whoa. Like, those ones before were nothing. That was what was missing in the Jewish prophecies that they weren't interpreting, is that it was two prophecies in Isaiah 53 and 1, the suffering servant, the suffering savior, and the um, returning triumphant king. It was two prophecies in one, one yet to be fulfilled, which is when he is going to return. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, every religion has their... They believe they're at that peak of the mountain and they can see the rain. Right, right. And I guess it's difficult for me when we're talking about this. It's like you passionately believe in that, and I agree that is a good thing. You have faith in that is what you yeah. establish. But there's also the same exact thing on the other side of the aisle, the same exact thing in the other. It's, right. It's difficult for. Well, I mean, this is why you have theological debates over the point. Well, and the, the thing that sets Christianity apart from all of them. From every other religion in the world, I don't care if it's Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Roman Catholicism, Islam, Jainism, they all tell you you have to do something to merit paradise, favor, heaven, whatever they call it, or like with the Buddhist nirvana. You have to do something to earn that. You have to follow the set of rules with Islam, the Hajj, you know, the, the five pillars of Islam, um, almsgiving, things like that. Christianity is the only one that says, the only one in all the world, the only world religion that says you can do nothing to please God because, uh, you, because of the sin that you carry that is offensive to him. Jesus Christ paid for it all on the cross. Believe in him and it's done. 
Well, wouldn't that be more of a detriment than that? Because if you establish rules of how, I mean, you can never be a perfect Jew because you can't follow right. every law. And exactly. The five pillar, well, the pillars of Islam are established to do these things because right. it's a way to be a good Muslim, right. not to be a perfect Muslim. Right. And Christianity has similar things as you do. Well, Roman Catholicism, they have established a doctrine, and then right. you. It's such a large denomination of people. This is a way to try and keep in a faithful path. So I guess yeah. you're right about it being more less on rules and more on interpretation right. and right. faith. But right. it's very difficult because it, like if you look at Protestants now, it's just so many different churches and it's right. Yeah, yeah. Over uh, fifteen thousand denominations, I think. So you know, I don't know if that's Protestant. The States, but, oh, yeah. It, yeah, worldwide, it's probably closer to thirty thousand. But when you look at other religions. Did you know Muhammad had no assurance he would go to paradise? If you read the Quran and the Hadith, he, did, he had no clue. The greatest prophet of Islam has no assurance of salvation. Well, he never said he had assurance of salvation. He more or less just... And well, yeah. Because you can never know with the works righteous salvation. You can never know with a works-based system if your work is good enough. Because you have this God who doesn't set forth clear standards. Uh, read the Quran. Uh, and, and I'll tell you this. Don't believe what I tell you. Tell, read what the Bible says. Read the Quran. Read the Book of Mormon. You know, read these things and see what literary train wrecks they are, first of all. And second of all, the Bible is attested by history, by science. You know, the one thing that makes Scripture true is that almost everything in it is falsifiable. It talks about real people in real places that actually exist, miracles that were witnessed by people. You can falsify these things. You cannot falsify anything in Islam. It's all based on faith. Now again, no other faith-based system gives you any assurance of salvation. The Bible assures you that if you believe these things, you can guarantee it, it that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life and no one can blot it out. Um, 1 John 5.13 says, I write these things to you that you may know you have eternal. Well, I mean, if you look at the, I see what you mean, but if you look at the Quran, Muhammad was a real person. We know that. Yeah. And that can't be falsified. But his uh, interpretations, he, the story about an angel and God writing the Quran on his heart, that could be interpreted and that can be seen as, you can't right. prove that quite there. Right. And there's things in Christianity that's as similar as that as well. Right. There is, we know that Jesus Christ existed, but right, we right. don't know if he committed some of the things he did. Mm -hmm. And miracles, yes, you can point to those as well. The Catholic mm -hmm. Church has a section that's dedicated to yes. miracles. But in a lot of ways, that helps solidify the position of the church in saying right. miracles. Right, right. So it's kind of a little difficult for some people to say, okay, point to a miracle, but that's helping you, so how is that, you know what I mean, factual? Um, how is it that when you proved it's a miracle, how does that make it a factual thing? Well, miracles were done for the attestation of the authority of Jesus and the apostles. When Jesus was performing miracles, he was doing it to prove himself. Like, look, I'm God. I'm spitting in mud, making clay, rubbing it on blind people's eyes, and they get their vision, you know? Um, I'm walking on water here. This is how you know that I'm God, because I'm doing these things. And Jesus gave these gifts to the apostles in the book of Acts. The book of Acts, all the miracles that are done there are to attest to the authority of their apostleship so that the rest of the letters and the things that they wrote, wrote you know, the rest of the New Testament that they wrote down, we know we can trust it because they had the same authority. They spoke with the words of God. They were inspired by God to do those things. You can't do those. You can't perform miracles. I cannot raise you from the dead. God could give me the power to do it. I don't believe he would. You know, he doesn't really work in that way today. Now that we have the Bible, God works differently now than he did then. But he's the same. I know it's a bit paradoxical, but that's just... That's what theological debate's for. Right. So, the, in, the, in the first century, they didn't have the Bible, so they had to have miracles. <laughs> All right? We got the Bible now, so we don't need miracles. How you doing, man? Good. I'm Len. Oh, nice to meet you, Len. What's your name? Tucker. Tucker? Yeah. Are you uh, are you a Christian or are you just... No. Nope. No? Do you want to get in the debate? I was actually going to get going. Oh, you I look just... freezing, dude. You look yeah, like I'm you're cold, cold, man. Thank you so much hey, for this. Hey, will you take... You got a DVD player? No, I do not. All right. But I haven't changed my opinion, but thank you so much for the Well, discussion. let me give you something to read in case there were any holes in what I said that might fill them in for you. Okay. 
Okay. It's a very short booklet. You can probably read it in, on the can or something. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Wes. Good talking. Thank you so much. You're, no, you're Connor. Wes was the guy before you. I Don't talked. worry about it. All right. Have a good one, man. Good talking.